Hi. Welcome to this first video in a series of extensive playthrough videos about Vortex, a 26 HP wide complex oscillator by the Dutch maker Cosmotronic. Vortex is a Eurorack compatible 100% analog dual triangle core oscillator with coarse and fine tune controls as well as octave switches for both VCOs. Vortex features wave shaping, phase modulation, ring modulation, two types of wave folding, two 12 dB per octave low pass filters, hard sync as well as soft sync. Additionally there's through zero linear FM and exponential FM for both VCOs, a lot of useful internally normalized connections for modulation and an array of inputs with attenuators for CV control of everything. The feature set of this complex oscillator is actually really impressive and I want to thank Cosmotronic for sending me one. In this first video about Vortex I'll do a quick rundown of all the features. I'll show you what the sliders and knobs, inputs and outputs do and how the normalized connections work. And of course I made way too many patches to show you how it all sounds in the context of a modular system. Let's have a listen to those before taking a closer look at the front panel of Vortex.
Now let's have a more methodical look at the features of Vortex. The top trace on the scope is the sign coming from the main output of VCO1. The bottom trace is the sign coming directly from the sign output of VCO2. This is VCO1, so the top trace. And this is VCO2. They sound exactly the same, but as I play them together, you can hear a beating going on. And that's not because there's any modulation going on, it's just because of the two sounds being slightly out of phase. Now let's tune VCO2 down and let's mute it for the moment. So we're only listening to VCO1. And as the sign of VCO2 is normalized to all the modulations of VCO1, we can just go ahead and move some sliders, turn some knobs to hear what it does. Let's start off with the wave folder. So this is just an internal wave folder. It's not receiving any modulation yet. For this to happen you have to turn this knob. This knob is an attenuator for the normalized modulation being the sign of VCO2. Of course you can patch any signal into the full input to use for modulation. Let me turn the wave folder up. What the modulation actually does is moving this slider for us. And this wave folder is calibrated in such a way that when you slide the slider completely down, the output coming out of the main output is a sine wave. Both the core of VCO1 and VCO2 are triangle waves. And an internal wave shaper shapes this triangle into a sine wave and a square wave, which I'm currently using to synchronize my scope. And these two outputs bypass all the modulations on the front panel, except for the FM. The triangle output is the triangle core of VCO1, but the shape changes as you use the shape slider. Now let's do some phase modulation. Again the sign of VCO2 is normalized to the phase modulation. Moving the slider up increases the depth of phase modulation by VCO2. You can use another signal for the phase modulation by patching any signal into the mod input. Now the depth of the phase modulation can be modulated by sending a signal into the depth input. This knob is an attenuator for that modulation. And this too is normalized to the sign of VCO2. This phase modulation is really rather pseudo phase modulation as it really only works when using the saw wave but we'll go into that later. phase modulation inside VCO1 is capable of shifting the phase of the wave 720 degrees when you're sending in positive voltages and minus 540 degrees when you send in negative voltages. The shape slider, as I mentioned before, 
shapes the sine derived from the triangle core into a trapezoid in the center position and into a saw wave at the top position. We can modulate this parameter by turning this knob and again sine of VCO2 is normalized to this modulation. Now if you want to hear the triangle instead of the sine, you just change to the triangle output. And as you'll see, this output is also affected by the shape slider, but it's not influenced by the phase modulation, or by the wave folder, or by the filter. Let's go back to the main output. Let's make this sound a little more rich. Maybe change the tuning of ECO2. Introduce some extra modulation to the shape. This is a nice sound. Let's close the filter. Let's turn down the modulation again. Let's go to the saw wave. The filter also has an attenuator for the modulation, which is also normalized to the sine of VCO2. So we can introduce some frequency modulation of the filter. You can also use external signals for modulating this filter, like for example an LFO or an envelope. You just patch this into the LPF or low pass filter input. And the knob acts as an attenuator for this external signal. To demonstrate what the sliders and knobs on VCO2 of Vortex do, I'm using a similar setup. The top trace is now the main output of VCO2, the bottom trace is the sign of VCO1 that's being used as a normalized modulator for all the parameters on VCO2. I'm using the square output of VCO2 to synchronize my scope. VCO1 is tuned to about the same pitch as VCO2 when I'm pitching it down one octave, just as I did when I was using VCO2 as a modulator for VCO1. So we're listening to the main output of VCO2. The shape slider is completely at the bottom and you might expect that this should produce a clean sine wave because the symbol is a sign, but that's not the case because the wave folder in VCO2 is a completely original and unique circuit which always introduces a slight distortion to the wave. Now if you need the clean waves, you can get these from the sign output, which is an output that bypasses the wave folder and the low pass filter. So when I move the shape slider now, You'll see that the clean sign coming from the sign output of VCO2 changes into a triangle and a saw wave. When you use this output, it's also going through the ring modulation, but not through the wave folder or the filter. 
Let's go back to the main output. So there is the distorted sign again. The top trace coming from the main output. When I move the slider, it becomes a distorted triangle. And in the top position, a somewhat distorted saw wave. And actually this is an inverse saw wave. I was always really confused by this. I thought this was a saw wave and the inverted one was a ramp wave, but that's not the case. A saw wave is the one that slopes up gradually and drops abruptly. A ramp wave is used when you're talking about a single cycle. And this, the one that rises abruptly and falls down gradually, is an inverse saw wave. I'll put the slider in the center position and I'll introduce some modulation. You just turn the knob and the sign from VCO1 is normalized to this attenuator and modulates the shape parameter. Next to the shape slider is the ring modulator. In this circuit, the wave of VCO2 is ring modulated with the sine wave of VCO1. And you increase the depth by sliding the slider up. You can use any signal to ring modulate VCO2 with by patching it into the mod input. And while the slider regulates the depth of the ring modulation, you can modulate this depth by patching any signal into the depth input. The knob is an attenuator for the signal and it is normalized again to the sign of VCO1. So the sign of VCO1 is used to ring modulate VCO2 with and is also used as a modulator for the depth of this ring modulation. But of course you can send any signal into the depth input to modulate the depth of the ring modulation and the knob is an attenuator for this external signal too. Then there's the wave folder. The wave folder, as I explained before, is a completely unique and original circuit designed by Cosmotronic. And it introduces a lot of distortion to the wave. And just as before, you can modulate this parameter by turning this knob and now the wave folder in VCO2 is modulated by the sign of VCO1 and again you can send in any signal into the fold input to modulate the strength of the wave folder And what's really interesting about both the wave folder of VCO1 and VCO2 is demonstrated here. When I put the slider in the completely down position and I modulate it with a bipolar signal, sometimes the offset generated by the knob and the modulation goes below zero. And whenever that happens, the wave folder acts as a VCO that's closing. So you can use either wave folder as a VCA for amplitude modulation. And when you're using a fast signal to modulate it, like we're doing now, this results in AM type sounds but you could also use an envelope with a slight negative offset into the fold input 
together with a low pass filter and its modulation input to mimic the behavior of a low pass gate or just a classic subtractive synthesis voice. The low pass filter in VCO2 is identical to the low pass filter in VCO1. Let's change to the saw setting, make it a little more rich sounding and let's close the filter. And you can also modulate this filter by turning up the attenuator. This again is using the normalized sign of VCO1, but you can patch in any signal into the LPF or low pass filter input to modulate the frequency of the low pass filter. To demonstrate the FM capabilities of Vortex, I've tuned VCO1 and VCO2 to approximately a major third or uh, four semitones apart from each other. Note that the knobs for the true zero linear FM are completely maxed out. But at the moment there is still no frequency modulation going on because for that to happen, you have to turn up the FM index knob, which controls the global amount of FM in both VCO1 and VCO2. So we're listening to VCO1, which is the top trace, and is the saw wave, and VCO2, which is the bottom trace, and this is the slightly distorted inverse saw. Now let's turn the FM index knob. You might notice there's two inputs for the FM index. These inputs are modulators for the FM index and the knob acts as an offset for whatever modulation you send into these inputs. Let's quickly patch an output coming from Delta V. Currently this is just looping and let's patch this looping envelope into the left FM index input. As you can see, the LEDs behind the FM index knob show us the global amount of FM. As you can see, depicted by the little white arrow between the left and the right FM index inputs, the left input is normalized to the right input. But you can just as well send in two separate modulators to the two inputs. Let's use channel 2 of delta V to modulate the FM index for the right VCO separately. Let's turn down the knobs for the true zero FM on both VCO1 and VCO2. So even with the FM index knob completely open, there's no FM going on because these set the maximum amount of FM.
for both VCOs separately and currently they're all set to zero. Let's remove the modulation for a moment. Let's turn the FM index knob down and let's listen to what exponential FM on both VCOs at the same time sounds like. patch in the modulation again into the FM index so this is only into the left input which is normalized to the right input as well so channel 1 of Delta V is controlling the FM index for both VCO1 and VCO2 but let's patch in channel 2 of Delta V to the FM index input for VCO2. Now let's turn up the through zero linear FM as well. So right now I've turned everything back down, all the knobs for the FM are at zero and the FM index knob is at zero as well and there's nothing patched into the FM index inputs. And at the moment we're only listening to VCO1. The modulators for the FM in Vortex for VCO1 are normalized to the sign of VCO2 and vice versa. Let me turn up the True Zero Linear FM. VCO1 is the top trace, by the way. And it's impossible to see from the scope but what makes through zero linear FM so special is that whenever the modulator, being the sign of VCO2, which is the bottom trace right now, closes in on zero, the core of VCO1 slows down, which is just like regular linear FM. When the voltage of the modulator goes up, the frequency of the modulated VCO goes up as well. When the voltage of the modulator goes down and closes in on zero, in through zero linear FM, the core actually stops when the modulator goes through zero. But whenever the modulator goes below zero, the core of the carrier starts oscillating again. The waveform is inverted. And this is something that doesn't happen in regular linear FM. In regular linear FM, our modulator is offset in such a way that normally it can never go below zero. So the core of the oscillator that's being frequency modulated never stalls. The main advantage of through zero linear FM is that the frequency modulation happens symmetrically around the zero axis resulting in a more stable pitch at the output. And this of course also yields different timbres from regular linear FM. Let's try patching in the output of channel 1 of delta V into the linear frequency modulation input. because Delta V sends out envelopes which are 
positive or negative only, depending on the setting on delta V. We're not getting a lot of the true zero action. But what I want to demonstrate with this is that the inputs for the linear frequency modulation are AC coupled. Which means there's a filter for the C signals, so slow LFOs and slow envelopes won't get through and won't have any effect to the frequency modulation. You really need fast signals for it to work. Using envelopes as a modulator for the linear FM is also a way to get classic linear FM sounds which don't go through zero. Let's demonstrate the exponential FM. There's also inputs for the exponential FM for both VCO1 and VCO2. These inputs are not AC coupled, which means you can send in whatever you want. Slow LFOs, fast LFOs, slow envelopes, fast envelopes, VCOs, you name it. So now I'm using channel 1 of delta V into the exponential input. And of course if you want a classic vibrato sound, it's best to patch an LFO into the exponential FM input of your VCO. Let's quickly try showing this. This is an LFO coming from the zone BF. And if you adjust either the knob for exponential FM or just the FM index, you can get a nice vibrato. To showcase the different sync options Vortex offers, let me break down this patch used in the patch examples. We're only listening to the main output of VCO1, and this is the top trace on zero scope. I'm using the square output of VCO2 to sync my scope. As you can see, there's some amplitude modulation on VCO1. This is coming from the delta V and is using the VCA functionality of the wave folder. Let me remove this. And let me remove the normalized modulation as well and just the wave folding altogether. I'm opening and closing my filter on VCO1 with an envelope coming from delta V. And let's remove this as well. There's a volt per octave sequence coming into the left input, but I've switched the volt per octave link switch to the right, which links the volt per octave input of the right VCO to the left one. And as you might notice, there's still some exponential modulation going on. This black stackable is an LFO coming from the zone BF and is pitch shifting VCO1. But you can't hear this pitch shifting because I've slaved VCO1 to VCO2. By flicking the switch named sync to the left. And this slaves the left oscillator to the right one. Let's listen to how it sounds when I remove this. Now you can clearly hear the effect of the LFO coming into the exponential FM input. Let me change the rate of the LFO. Now VCO2 is not receiving any LFOs to modulate the pitch. It's only receiving the volt per octave input coming into the first VCO by linking it. 
And when you sync VCO1, that's receiving the pitch sequence, as well as some modulation, to VCO2, which is only receiving the Volper octave sequence, you get this really cool sync tones. Let me turn it down slightly. Now this is also a really cool way to get some pulse width animation or pseudo pulse width modulation. If you listen to the square output, which is not affected by any of the settings of the sliders on the front panel, but it is influenced by the FM settings and the sync settings. Let me slow down the LFO again. And as you can see, when you don't push the exponential frequency modulation too far, and you listen to a square wave that's being synced to another VCO, then you get these BWM style sounds. Let me remove the full proactive sequence so you can hear the effects of sync better. Now when I increase the effect of the LFO coming into the exponential FM input, at certain settings, this resembles pulse width modulation that's going through zero. I'm sure Nick Bat would approve. So I kind of reset it, Vortex, and right now we're listening to VCO1, which is the top brace on the scope. So to demonstrate the sync settings of Vortex a little more in detail, let me slave VCO1 to VCO2. So then, as you can hear, when I move the coarse tuning knob of VCO1, which is the slave, the pitch really doesn't change, it just changes the timbre. For a pitch change to happen, you have to change the pitch of the master, which is VCO2 for the moment. So now as you can see on the scope, the top trace is the output from the main output of VCO1. And the bottom trace is the square coming from VCO2 that's also used internally to sync VCO1 to now, there's another little switch to the left here and to the right of the main sync toggle switch. And this one chooses which type of sync you're using. At the moment it's in the top position, which means it's doing hard sync. And what hard sync really does is whenever there's a rising edge on the master, the face of the slave oscillator resets. And you can see this very clearly that whenever the pulse wave of VCO2 comes up again, the VCO1 is being reset. Now when you flick this little switch into the bottom position, soft sync is used. Let's try to find a setting that actually works on the scope. Here you can see it a little bit better. What soft sync does is whenever there's a rising edge coming from the master VCO, the slave VCO switches between rising and falling edges. As you can see here, the sign is on its falling edge. And when it receives a sync signal coming from the master VCO, it switches over to the rising edge of its oscillations. And while hard sync has a really unique timbre, I think soft sync is really interesting because it can produce these kind of octave switching effects. Let's see what happens when I 
change the tuning on the master. And of course you can use it with every wave Vortex has to offer. It even works when you're using the direct outputs or the triangle and the sine wave. And the square, which, as I demonstrated earlier, can give us some pseudo pulse with modulation. Now the sync capabilities for VCO2 are exactly the same. Let's switch over to listening to VCO2 and let's flick this toggle switch to the right position. And this means that the right VCO is slave to the left one. So the left one is now the master controlling the pitch. Let's listen to the main output. So VCO2 is the bottom trace by the way and it's being synced to VCO1 so changing the tuning of VCO2 only changes the timbre and we're currently in the hard sync setting when we switch over to the soft sync setting this also produces some of those cool octave switching effects and to conclude this section about sync there's two sync inputs that override the internal normalizations. You can use any signal into these sync inputs. I've successfully used sines and triangles as well as the preferred square waves into the sync inputs and they all seem to work just fine as long as the amplitude of the signal you're sending into these sync inputs is high enough. This video is already way too long, so this is it for now. I will do a follow-up video to this one, zooming in a little closer on the circuit of VCO1 that's used to shape, fold and phase modulate the oscillations. And I'll explain what pseudo-phase modulation is, as well as how to do true phase modulation. I will also show you how to use the wave folder in both VCO1 and VCO2 as a VCA and I'll demonstrate in more detail how to use the different kinds of frequency modulation. I hope you learned something in this video and if there's any questions please leave them in the comments. Thanks for watching.